And but I, and and this isn't going to be this isn't going to be a a sermon that you're used to maybe from me. Um, I'm going to uh, make some some very broad brush strokes and some generalizations and hopefully I'm not over generalizing and things but you'll kind of get the idea the overarching idea of what I'm after here and uh, and I pray that uh, uh, we would do well uh, uh, in it and in this time I I'm going to read these with you so as we as we start I want you to have these passages of scripture in mind as we continue, uh, as we go through the message for today. I, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a lot of exegesis, hardly any, if any. It's not going to be a regular expository uh, sermon. Uh, it's just some things that kind of broadly, principally, I guess, in terms of principles that I'm thinking of and that uh, we'll revisit uh, in the future. So Daniel chapter 2 to start with, uh, verse 35 and then verse 44. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And that was part of Daniel recounting to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, his dream. And then as he began to interpret, he ends uh, in verse, or begins to end in verse 44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Then skipping over to chapter 7. <clears throat> chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, Daniel was seeing more visions and the great beasts that were arising and uh, the Ancient of Days in verse 9 took his place and then in verses 13 and 14 Daniel says I kept looking in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And then in the New Testament, Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> starting at verse 16, uh, down through verse 21. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 down through verse 21. This is the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. He had just come through the temptation and had been strengthened by the angels. And now he begins his ministry. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And, was at, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So keep those in mind as we travel through these uh, thoughts together this morning. What does it mean to be truly free or to have liberty? Some think of it... Uh, 
maybe solely in terms of an external idea. They'll say, when all slavery of every kind is eradicated, subjugation of all kinds. Now, we don't have officially have slavery here in this country anymore, but there are countries that do, and there are countries that are engaged in, in uh, holding slaves and making slaves and that kind of thing, and it's uh, uh, not only that, but in tra terms of trafficking and you know, kidnapping young girls. And I think, wasn't it that you guys not that long ago had a thing that you were listening to someone talk about that kind of thing happening here in the cities? And we think it's maybe over there, but it happens here as well. And they talk about, well, if this can end, then we'll be free. Well, some say also, when we think about liberty and freedom, some say when governments are shrunk to sufficient size where they cannot uh, become or be tyrannical any longer. Others, on the opposite side of the spectrum, talk about when governments are of sufficient size to make sure that life is fair and even-handed and those kinds of things. Then we shall be truly free. Some recognize that liberty or freedom has more to do uh, than just with subjugation or how one lives in light of big or small government. And they recognize uh, micro-slavery situations, addictions of various kinds. Drugs and alcohol, perhaps, are, are two of the most uh, uh, prominent that you think of when you think of uh, being addicted to something. But, you know, gaming, you know, videos, that kind of thing, it, it can encompass all kinds of things, though, as well. Uh, authoritarian types of behavior. And maybe you're, you're a controlling type of person and you need to be in charge no matter what. And you can't stand it if there's silence or you can't stand it if a situation arises where you're not actually doing something about it. And, or maybe just angry people or obsessive compulsive people, that kind of thing where um, we recognize inherently that individually there are things that go on that... that uh, go beyond or, or maybe more depth than just one person or country subjugating another person or people to themselves, but that slavery, that kind of thing, not being free is manifested in uh, this as well. People want to be liberated, but often find themselves trapped in situations in which they are enslaved and can't often find a way out, or they, they just can't see anymore, they just don't know uh, a way out. And so we have specialists who seek to help us in various kinds of situations. So we have psychologists who use talk therapy. Uh, one group says you're an animal and you need to be trained as any other animal needs to be trained. And your liberty comes in recognizing your training and if we can just get people trained the right way, then they'll be free. Uh, there are various types of uh, cognitive therapies wherein the mind is changed and so their thinking is that behavior will change. Psychosocial development therapies, the idea of you got to go through certain stages, and if you don't go through it right, then you're going to have complications uh, when you're older. Psychoanalytical therapy, Sigmund Freud, psychoanalysis, lay on the couch, interpret dreams, those kinds of things. Here's where your problem is in your development, and this is what we do to correct it. Self-help therapies, Carl Rogers, and... Uh, other humanistic type uh, therapies where the solution is within yourself. These are, are people who deal with uh, things that go on in people's lives as individuals. Then we have psychiatrists also who use, often use drug therapy to make people better. And so they'll turn to the diagnostic and statistical manual. I think uh, version 5 is out now. And uh, they'll run through the list of behaviors and, and, uh, uh, and look at that and compare it with your life. And they'll say, if you match, not that if you do any of them, you're in trouble, but you've got to match a certain percentage with a certain intensity, then they can diagnose you appropriately. And they, they plug you in here and they say, this is what's wrong. 
And then they'll often say, well, we can give you some medication to help this or that aspect of your life. And, and depending on how you respond, they'll ask you a series of questions when you come back. And they'll adjust the medication a little bit here, a little bit there, give you more, give you less, whatever the case may be, uh, to try and help you out and solve uh, your problems and uh, as an individual. Then there are those sociologists who look at the big picture that looks at society as a whole, who deal with groups in terms of social constructs, religion, marriage, family, uh, other group dynamics in various situations, gangs, whatever it might be, and they study various aspects of these things. And if humanity has problems, they view it as a breakdown in social constructs. Various group systems are analyzed to find the problem, and cultural norms might have to be reevaluated. And then sociological theories need to come into play, and then cultural solutions are applied. Then there has to be re-education of the masses through, through elementary school, on up through middle school, high school, and they'll re-educate you in terms of these are the things that need to be done. For instance, over in the UK, a Jewish school, you may have heard of it this last week, I can't remember the name of the school, it's a Jewish school, and they are going, the, and the UK is just about ready to make them cease to exist because they will not teach uh, LGBTQ uh, ideas in their school. And if you are going to be a state-sponsored school or a recognized school, you have to do everything that the state says and you can't leave anything out. That's the idea that we're after here. That's what they do. So once something has changed in society and, and the powers that be say this is something that we now must recognize and, and accept as a society, then it is top down and you must accept these things. If you don't, then we need to make it so that you cease to exist. Now, it's a very sad situation over there uh, because they're learning everything else they really need to learn, uh, but they're possibly going to be forced to stop and cease because they do not teach uh, the full spectrum of what, uh, of what the state wants. Hegel, the, the philosopher and, and uh, sociologist, he outlines a conflict social theory wherein the predominant cultural norms are the thesis, then there's opposition that arises to it which serves as the antithesis, then out of this conflict comes what he calls a synthesis and that's how he sees society developing and he does a lot with Karl Marx as well and Marx used some of his stuff as well in their, in their social theories. So we have a question to ask when you think about it. I know I just rapidly went through them and I'm, I'm running out of time already, but we have a question to ask in light of what goes on in terms of, of being caught in things and going to psychologist or psychiatrist or seeing what sociologists do. We ask the question, what is the goal? What is the goal? <clears throat> Well, ultimately it is a counter kingdom set up to rival God's kingdom, a humanistic utopia, if you will. So from the time of ancient Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, I just pulled a few of these out. There's, I'm sure, more. The Medo-Persian Empire, Greece, Rome. All of these nations have set up rivals to the living God. And all of them sought to overcome all other obstacles in the world to be the world dominant power. Since then, well, we've had Islam. Islam arose in the Middle East, through North Africa, around the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea, trying to push northward, and then also uh, northwestward into Spain and, and trying to envelop the whole of 
of the world. In fact, one of their stated purposes is that Islam will dominate and take over the entire world. And, and that, you know, has just simply never been denied. That is their goal. And we know with Muhammad, their prophet, uh, who started this whole thing, that that subjugation can be deceptive, but it can also be with, through the use of force through the use of force and they're still at it still wanting to see that happen uh, the 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 thing that is against them is they can't unite around one set of ideas or one person uh, to accomplish that goal there's the old Soviet um, empire that came along that same idea of wanting to spread communism or their idea of totalitarianism really around the world. Uh, we've had a president, previous president, talk about a new world order. And so there's this idea that a new world order will be coming on the horizon. And we have the European Union and, and so on. This counter kingdom is headed by none other than Satan himself. Although not always united, they join in common cause as standing opposed to the kingdom of God. Each one comes at it from a different perspective, but united in an underlying philosophy of opposition to the kingdom. Now some people see the European Union, uh, I've heard said, as a revival of the old Roman Empire. Others speak of Islam the countries surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the predominant uh, view there is Islam, especially in the south and North Africa. Uh, we have Islam and then around through Turkey and so on, where it has dominated. And there is still that idea that something might come of, of that. So that's, in a nutshell, the world's message. Nebuchadnezzar was part and uh, parcel of God's plan and purpose. It dealt with, the world tries to deal with individuals and it tries to deal with countries as a whole. Then we have the Bible's message, wherein God's kingdom is predominant. And God's kingdom accounts for the individual. That is, what, what psychology and psychiatry seek to accomplish the scriptures do accomplish. The scriptures, the, the very Greek word, suke, right? Psychology comes from suke and logos, study of the soul. Well, who is it that is able to study the soul better than anyone else? Well, it's the living God as he reveals himself and his ways in the scripture. Again, I'm sort of plugging what's going to go on up north. I need to make some materials available for anyone that wants to be able to be part of that and learn about that but but they try to substitute certain things for what God sets forth in his word but, but it's not just the individual but also for social constructs uh, pertinent to a thriving society so in sociology political theory education Anything else, family, religion, anything that affects society as a whole, the scriptures speak to as well. So it deals with society as well as personal problems, but it does more than that. Unlike the world's kingdoms, God's kingdom gets to the root issues that face humanity in mass, that is as a whole, and then as individuals as well. God's kingdom deals with the root problem between nations and between individuals. More importantly, the problem between nations and individuals before God. The root problem, the enmity that exists, the enmity that was put there. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel set up an antithesis right away from the beginning after the fall. It is sin caused and it's that enmity that drives wedges between individuals and between nations and so forth. 
And God's kingdom uh, deals with the problem while balancing the importance of the individual and the community as a whole, the nation, the people as a group. Very often we split over the idea of, no, it's just the individual we need to be concerned with. No, it's the groups of people we need to be concerned with. On the other side, and because it's an, uh, it's, it arises out of a kingdom that opposes the kingdom of God, they can't get together. And only the scriptures address in proper uh, proportion the individual and also uh, the common good of groups and so on. Our country itself seems to be in the throes of one side emphasizing the individual while the other emphasizes the group uh, or groups within the whole and we run into trouble. God's kingdom offers a message of hope to the individual in which the desperate and broken may find stability and wholeness. Luke, right? Remember? Told you to keep it in mind. And he came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the broken, the bankrupt. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, those who find themselves enslaved to various habits and behaviors that they can't seem to get rid of. The recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. It offers a message of hope in which those who know the depths of their sin and they know they're responsible. You know, I know I am responsible. I just don't want to admit it. The thing is, you know you are responsible for what you do and you struggle with admitting it. Jesus came to set us free from that kind of thing. And those who acknowledge it, those who confess it, those who come to grips and terms with it are forgiven. In which those who know the consequence of their sin puts them at enmity with the one who created them. And that's really the nutshell, the nub of it, if you will. It isn't just about the individual with another individual, but it's I have, I have offended the living God. And there is enmity there that keeps me separated from him. It is coming to grips with that that allows me to see and hear and understand and to then seek forgiveness from him. And that forgiveness comes in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And when we go to the table, that is exactly what we are speaking to. It is the gospel that we are proclaiming as we partake of the elements. The message of redemption. And that without participating in that, because you, you physically partake of the bread and the cup, acknowledging without participating in the redemptive work in, of Christ that you have, we have no hope. But it isn't just to the individual, it is also to the nations. God's kingdom offers a message of hope to the nations in which nation after nation seeks ascendancy in the world, in which nation after nation seeks to put down those who oppose him. We see conflicts arising here and there in which nation after nation seeks to usurp God's rightful place and oppose God's program. That really there for the nations is the nub of the issue there. Refusing to submit to the one true and living God. Nevertheless, the nations belong to the Son. Psalm 2, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance. Daniel and what we read here, the rock, right, that is cut out. It became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. 
In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was also like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were open. And I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. And then he kept looking in verse 13 in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. You see, it isn't just individuals. It's that the nations as well might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is the one which will not be destroyed. Other nations try to, uh, seek to overcome the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, to overthrow his rule and reign in the world, but they fail every time, every time. So God's kingdom will prevail. All the nations will come under his rule and under his authority. All the nations will come under his just discernment and judgment. All the nations in that day will be healed. It's interesting. We don't make much of that. We usually speak of the individual, that the individual is healed, and that we as individuals will be in the Lord's presence together. But the scriptures are very clear that the nations will be healed. They will live in his light. So in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, we read, and he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street on either side was, of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will be no longer, there, there will no longer be any curse and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. God's kingdom will prevail. Sometimes I think as Christians, as much as, as much as sometimes our eschatology tells us that, you know, some believe things are just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse, I wish we'd get off of that and talk positively about the kingdom of God prevailing. Sitting in a hermeneutics class at Bethel Seminary under Bob Stein, he was talking to us about various things, and, he, and I think I've shared this before, but it's worth mentioning again that Christians in Africa especially who are under persecution, the favorite, their favorite book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. And they draw great encouragement from it because in there is spelled out the victory of Jesus Christ, the prevailing of the kingdom of God over all other kingdoms that seek to oppose it and try to overthrow it Instead, the kingdom of God overthrows all these other pretenders and prevails. A message of true liberty as we think about some of these things that we've talked about. I know I've rushed through a lot. Must center on the reign of God. 
uh, God reigns. Satan has limited rule and only by God's permission. God reigns. It must center on the justice of God. There's the idea of justice that, that people have and then there's God's justice and we need to see God's justice prevail. Those who, who feel they have been unjustly accused or unjustly treated must not appeal to, to human thinking in terms of seeking justice, but must turn to the justice of God because only His prevails. And it must center on the redemption of God in Christ for forgiveness of sins, the taking away of the enmity that exists, and the healing of the nations. And it must center on the truth that the nations are His. Therein lies the liberty we seek. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us this morning and contemplating in broad strokes some of these ideas of, of being caught as individuals in things that, that uh, we know are detrimental to us and yet we continue in them and, and we look on a national scale and we see things going on and we wonder... Uh, where the answer lies, and yet it is with you always. So Lord, let us not lose sight of that. Let us not lose sight of where true liberty resides. It's in you for both the individual and as a nation. And may we, O oh Lord, set forth the example of following you and seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. And we'll give you the glory through Christ. Amen. Our ushers are uh, getting prepared to, to uh, come receive our offering as they do I invite you to stand with me as we sing together the doxology praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly host praise father son and holy ghost our father in heaven as we think about liberty we think about you because you are the one who sets us free and uh, the recognition that in setting us free that we have that by your hand we enjoy the many blessings we in turn give because we know that it is through the faithful giving of your people that the needs of the church uh, are met and that the message of truth the gospel goes forth not just here but into the nations as well and so, Lord, receive this offering from our hand and multiply it for your use and for your glory, we pray, through Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
that hardy ass jail. Before we approach uh, the table together, uh, our communion song, Your Supper, Lord, Before Us Spread, I invite you to turn in your song sheets and your worship bulletins, or it'll be on the screen as we stand together singing. prepared to approach the table then this morning, we read of a caution in the scriptures that basically say that we need to come in a worthy manner, humbly and uh, in thinking of the body of Christ. Paul writes, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So the scriptures call for an, examinations of our, an examination of each of our lives. And again, uh, not in light of someone else, but in light of your own life before God. Your life is not judged in comparison to someone else. It is, it is judged in light of His glory. So we want to give you a few moments of silence to approach the Lord and examine your own life, to confess any sins that need to be confessed, 
as we uh, and be reconciled in any way that you need to be reconciled as we approach the table then and then I'll close us in prayer after a few moments of silence Our gracious God and Father in heaven, standing in light of your wonderful glory, we are humbled. Uh, we are humbled that you, the living and true God, who, exalt, who is exalted above all gods and all things, would take note of us and extend your mercy and grace to us, to creatures such as us. And yet that is what you did in Jesus. And you call us to come to the table to remember and to examine ourselves. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those things that we have done in thought, word, and deed, remove from us and root out from us, O oh Lord, by the Spirit and your word as you continue to work in us after your will and, and continue to uh, transform us from glory to glory into the image of your beloved Son. Father, we approach the table in humble gratitude for what you have done for us because there was nothing that we could do to save ourselves. There was nothing that we could do to be forgiven, to become new creatures you alone are able you alone O oh Lord and so we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to remember again what you have done on our behalf and we give you glory through Christ amen we read in the scriptures for I received from the Lord that which I, I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, we don't come before you lightly in this moment because this isn't anything that you did lightly on our behalf. Uh, Lord, this was an incredible thing that you've done on our behalf. One thing that you have centered all history around. And Lord, we thank you for your love for us and we pray, Father, that you would be glorified in us. And uh, we give this... And we partake of this uh, because we want to partake in fellowship with you. And we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray.
In the upper room with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body. Give